Let's look at another problem. And as we go through this problem, let's uh, spend more and more time talking about exactly what you should write. Don, this is from July uh, 2000 bar, page 9. Dan was arrested and charged with possession of heroin with intent to sell. Okay, think about that. Element, possession of heroin with intent to sell. What does that mean? It means that the state's got to prove he possessed it and the state has to prove his state of mind intent to sell. So any evidence which the state offers must be relevant, must be uh, a rational way to attempt to prove either state of mind, either prove uh, that he possessed it or intended to sell it. Uh, continuing to read, Dan allegedly sold a small bag of heroin to Peters. Aha. Uh -huh. There's your not only intent to sell, he actually sold it to Peters, who's an undercover officer at Guy's Bar and Grill. So the state is going to try to prove that Dan sold heroin to Peters, an undercover officer. So why are they charging him with possession with the intent to sell? Why don't they just charge him with selling it? I don't know. But in any event, the charge is possession with intent to sell. And if he actually sold it, that would certainly tend to prove that he possessed it and intended it. In his opening statement, Dan's lawyer said, the evidence would show that Dan was entrapped. Okay, so we have two substantive claims going on here. One is the state saying that Dan possessed with the intent to sell, and Dan is saying, you entrapped me. So we have to know exactly what entrapment is. Well, there are two views as to what entrapment is. One view is that uh, if the person was already predisposed to commit the crime and the police simply provided the opportunity and then arrested the person when they committed it, that's not entrapment because the person was just looking for an opportunity to commit the crime anyway. So that's not entrapment if the person was predisposed. But in that case, of course, the state has to prove that the person was predisposed to commit the crime. Now, the second view of entrapment is that it has nothing to do with the person's predisposition to commit crimes or inclination or any of that stuff to commit the crime. The other view of entrapment is that it is purely a question of what kind of conduct will you tolerate from your police department. If your police departments are going too far in creating the crime, okay, how far will you allow them to go in creating crime? And it's that public policy decision that sets the boundary for entrapment in uh, those second class of jurisdictions. So Dan is saying I was entrapped, but we don't know whether Dan was saying I did not have uh, the uh, predisposition to commit the crime. You created the predisposition, so to speak, to commit the crime, or that this, whatever you did to me the public should not allow its police departments to go that far. Uh, continuing, the following incidents occurred at trial. One, the promoter called Wolf. The promoter called Wolf, uh, a patron at Guy's Bar. Prost I mean, prosecutor called Wolf, a patron at Guy's Bar who testified over defense objections now, and these evidence questions, when they tell you the defense objectives, right there he knows what, where the problem is. 
uh, over the fence objections that Dan told him the night before the alleged sale that Dan intended to sell some baggage to Peters the next night. Uh, and so, and so, uh, the uh, pro the defense objected to Wolf's testimony. Wolf's testimony is that I'm Wolf. Dan told me that Dan intended to sell some baggies tomorrow night. So I'm testifying that Dan told me that. Now, are you going to let that in? I said, well, let's see. Is it relevant? Sure, if Dan told me he's going to sell some baggies that night, the next night, that's relevant on did he actually do it? Or did he have the intent to do it the next night? because they're charging him with intent to do it. And so it makes it look so, yes, this is relevant on Dan's intent to sell. Foundation. I, Wolf, I'm testifying, I have personal knowledge that Dan told me this. And so what I'm telling you here at trial, I have personal knowledge. That's enough connection. Foundation. Exclusions. Is there any reason to exclude my testimony here in court telling you what Dan told me? Well, let's see. If I'm offering what Dan told me for its truth, then it's hearsay. So, um, I'm saying Dan told me he intended to sell some baggies tomorrow night. If that's being offered for its truth, that Dan really did intend to sell some baggies tomorrow night, then I'm offering you hearsay. Dan told me what his intent was, and now I'm offering it to you for the truth of what he said his intent was. That's hearsay. But Dan was declaring his present state of mind when Dan said, I intend to sell some baggage tomorrow night. So we have declaration of present state of mind by Dan, exception to the hearsay rule. So as to a wolf's testimony, wolf's testimony is, is that Dan said, I'm going to sell some baggage tomorrow, no tomorrow night. You first have to clarify what baggage means. You know, mention that. And then wolf's testimony is relevant because it tends to show that since Dan intended tonight to sell baggage tomorrow night, he had that intent then also. So it's relevant on Dan's intent the following night when he was busted. Foundation, yes, Wolf has personal knowledge of what he's testifying to. Exclusion, what Wolf is testifying to is hearsay, but you have declaration of present state of mind. Dan declaring his present state of mind exception to the hearsay rule. Um, second, the prosecutor called Peters, who testified that she was working as an undercover officer. Okay, Peters testifying, and Peters says, I was working undercover, and I received information that Dan was selling heroin. Okay? So what did she do? She testified at Guy's Bar. So she testified that she went to Guy's bar two nights before the date of the arrest. Okay, there's certainly nothing to I mean the uh, um, and finally it says over defense objections so this is where you start analyzing the objections. 
don't object to the stuff that she said so far. I mean, don't discuss that because there was no objection. They're saying here, over defense objections, Peter testified. She talked to Bob, who's another patron. Well, we don't care whether she talked to Bob or not. But Bob told her he bought marijuana from Dan the night before. So the question is, are you going to let Peter testify that Bob told me that Bob bought marijuana from Dan? Well, let's see. Peter's is on the stand. Let me be Peter's. I want to tell you that I talked to Bob and Bob told me Bob bought marijuana from Dan so I'm offering that for its truth that Bob really did do that. So, first of all, is it relevant whether or not Bob bought marijuana from Dan? Well, uh, the argument is if Dan is selling marijuana that makes it more likely he's selling heroin. Well, I don't know if that's true. Uh, probably not true. So, uh, the evidence that Dan sold marijuana may not be relevant on the question of selling heroin. Also, it might be very prejudicial. Uh, if it doesn't tend to prove much, it's obviously very prejudicial. Um, and uh, you could argue it's more prejudicial than probative, make an argument. So under relevance, the question is, is selling marijuana relevant to the charge of selling heroin? And is telling the jury this person sold marijuana substantially more prejudicial than probative? That's 403. And it might be. So those are the two things here under relevance. Foundation. Well, um, uh, does she, uh, Peters has personal knowledge of what she is testifying to that Sam, uh, that Bob said this to me. And exclusion, obviously hearsay. Uh, Bob said, uh, Bob said he bought marijuana from, from Dan, and I'm offering it for its truth. Um, so it's hearsay. What exception do I have to the hearsay rule? Well, Bob is making an admission. I bought marijuana. But Bob doesn't perceive this. Bob doesn't know he's talking to a cop. And so, uh, the, um, uh, can I still call that admission? I bought marijuana from him. Well, no, this is, it's not Bob, it's not an admission by Bob, because it's not Bob's trial. But maybe Bob is making a declaration against his own interest. Maybe we could use that for a hearsay exception. Bob says, I bought some marijuana. That's a crime. The trouble is that Bob doesn't know he's talking to a cop. And so he's not, when you declare against your own interest, you have to know you're doing that. That's what makes it more likely to be true, because people don't speak out against their own interests normally. So as to Bob, what Bob said to me, if I'm a Peter, what Bob said to me is obviously hearsay. Exception, well, it's not an admissions exception because it's not Bob's trial. It's not a declaration against interest exception because Bob doesn't know he's declaring anything against his interest. Do we have any other exceptions where if I'm Peters and I'm trying to tell you what Bob said to me, Bob said he bought some marijuana from Dan, any other exceptions that would work there? Um, Bob didn't say he was going to buy some marijuana from Dan. He may have a declaration of you know, present state of mind, intent to do something, we don't have that. So I'm not sure we have any other exceptions. So maybe this statement 
what Bob said to me, Peters, is really not admissible. Because I don't have an exception to the hearsay rule. Furthermore, it may not even be wrong. So as to the Peter's testimony, we have um, relevance. Is selling marijuana relevant to selling heroin? So this may not be relevant. Secondly, it may be substantial, more prejudicial than probative, telling the jury about other crimes that the person allegedly committed when he's not even being charged with them. So it may be violated 403. Foundation, Peters has personal knowledge of what Bob said to her. She didn't have to know it's true, but she has personal knowledge of what Bob said. Exclusion is uh, hearsay because this is being offered for its truth. I mean, the mere fact that Bob said, uh, I bought some marijuana from Sam, that's not relevant. But if Bob actually bought marijuana from Dan, that makes it a little more relevant. And so uh, we're offering what Bob said for its truth, not just the fact that Bob said it. The only significance at all is if Bob is telling the truth, that he bought some marijuana from Dan. So uh, we have hearsay. I don't think we can get past the hearsay exception. This brings us to the third part. Peters testified she found out that Dan used email. Okay. Um, over defense objections, this is where you start your objections, she testified that she had emailed Dan a message. Okay, nothing wrong with that. It's not irrelevant yet. A message to meet her at Guy's Bar with a small bag of heroin on the night in question. So, she emailed him saying, please bring some heroin. Now, is that, is that entrapment? Well, if he already had the tendency, the disposition, um, to sell the heroin, then simply buying it, giving him the opportunity is not really, um, it's not really entrapment. But we don't know if Dan had a disposition to do this. We don't, we don't have any other evidence. We don't. She just says, will you sell me some? Well, on the other hand, if Dan wasn't selling, he probably wouldn't sell her any. So I don't know how you're going to argue this. But the point is that you see the entrapment issue right there where she asked Dan, please bring me some, bring up your two theories of entrapment and discuss them. And maybe, um, you don't have to bring them up right now, but when uh, his, uh, he's offering the defense of entrapment, and so anything which is said that tends to prove the entrapment can get admitted as being relevant on the issue of entrapment. Instead of being relevant on the issue of possession with intent to sell, evidence can be relevant on the issue of entrapment. And so her asking Don to bring her some uh, heroin is um, uh, relevant on the issue of Don's intent to bring it, to sell to her, and it's also relevant on the issue of entrapment. So, this statement is relevant for two purposes so far. So, she uh, says, would you please bring some heroin uh, on the night in question? Now, we have a problem here because she's testifying that she sent the email, but isn't, this, isn't that relevant only if Dan received it? Because if Dan received it, the argument is, well, he came to the guy's bar bringing the heroin because I asked him to, and that shows intent to sell. Uh, but if Dan didn't get this message, then you can't use it to show intent to sell. 
So how do we know that Dan ever received this email? And if he never received it, there isn't some evidence that he received it, then it's really not relevant. But does the state have any evidence that he received it? Well, if this were a letter that you mailed to someone, there's a presumption that letters which were mailed were received. But this is not a letter. So this is an email. We don't have a presumption that emails that were sent were received. Even if it was received, maybe he hasn't read it. So there's a serious question here as to whether or not her testimony is relevant that she sent the email unless you have some evidence that he received it. And I'm not quite sure where you're going to get that evidence from, but let's continue. Um, Peter preserved a paper copy of her email message. Wow, she's ready to prove that she sent this email message. But that doesn't prove he's got it. It may tend to prove that she sent it. And she's already testified she sent it. But it doesn't prove he got it. And it says, over defense objections, it was introduced in evidence. Well, let's see. Shall we allow Peter's testimony in? And shall we allow the document in? As to Peter's testimony, that she sent this uh, letter, sent this email to Dan, is it relevant? Well, the email she sent to Dan is relevant only, is, is relevant on the issue of Dan's intent to sell only if there's some evidence that Dan received it. So far, we don't have any. Secondly, the statement that she made that I asked Dan to bring some heroin is secondly relevant on entrapment. And so you bring out your two theories of entrapment. Are you going to let the state go this far? You'd have to look at the case law and the jurisdiction they made there is right close to the line. Don't know. But probably the state can go far enough to think someone is dealing just to ask them, will you sell me some? Um, uh, what about did they induce this person to commit the crime by asking for the heroin? Well, probably not. If you ask somebody who isn't selling heroin, they're not going to start selling it. They'll sell it to you, probably. So, uh, it's relevant on um, it's relevant on the issue of entrapment, and it's relevant on the issue of Dan's intent. So we'll also discuss Dan's intent and discuss entrapment. Foundation, yes, we, we're just talking about her testimony that she sent the email. She knows she did that. Exclusions, it's not hearsay or anything. Um, but the real reason that this may not be admissible is you've got to put on some evidence that Dan received it. Next comes the type her email paper trail she has. She brought that. Are you going to admit that? Well, um, it's, um, it's the original. And she authenticated it. That's what it is. It's the original. Um, so is the document relevant? Well, it has some tendency to, print, to prove she sent the email. Foundation, she's got the original. Exclusions, nothing there. So it's the same question. You, you let in uh, Peter's testimony and you let in this document only if there's some evidence that they have received it and we don't have any yet. Two paragraphs. The defense called Dan as a witness. Dan testified that Peters begged and pleaded him to get heroin for her because she was suffering from withdrawal and needed a fix. Well, 
If that's true, that's true, that's entrapment. Where the person, the DA, the, the, the agent, you know, begs for a case is right on point. Begs for heroin, says, gee, I really need it badly, I'm trying to break the habit, but right now I just can't. The DEA agent did this to somebody who was in a treatment program, had been jailed for heroin, was in a treatment program trying to get himself straight, and this agent approached him at the treatment program and said, would you please, please get me some? And repeatedly, finally he got us some, and then they busted him. And the appeals court said, that is entrapment if I've ever heard it. So here, here Peter, according to him, is begging for heroin, and uh, so this is probably entrapment now. So her testimony, his testimony is relevant on the issue of entrapment, both, both, uh, both rules of entrapment still be relevant. Let's continue. Uh, on cross-examination, uh, the prosecution asked Dan over defense objection. Uh, now this is your objection. Defense objection. Isn't it true that you were arrested by the police for selling marijuana in 1994? So Dan is on the stand, and the prosecution says to Dan, isn't it true you were arrested for selling marijuana in 1994? But that obviously is either an attempt to impeach Dan by prior conviction, and this is not a conviction, so that won't work. Mention it though. Or this is uh, an attempt to show that Dan was already predisposed to sell drugs. And therefore, they did not entrap him. And if you're in a jurisdiction where predisposition is the standard. So the prosecution says, isn't it true that you were arrested for selling marijuana in 1994? That question is improper because as a method of impeachment, it's improper impeachment. And uh, if it's uh, offered to show um, predisposition, I don't think this... Uh, Selling marijuana is a predisposition to selling heroin. In any event, Dan answered, Yes, but they didn't have any evidence to make the charge stick. And the prosecution wants to strike Dan's answer. Dan said, uh, Yes, I was, but they didn't have any evidence to charge me. Well, if you're going to let the question in, the question shouldn't be admitted. If you're going to let the question in, asking him, isn't it true you were convicted, you were arrested, when people's arrest record shouldn't be admitted, say, isn't it true you were, if you ask him that, then you should let him explain the arrest. And he says, no, he says, yes, I was arrested, but they didn't have anything on me. And that's relevant, because uh, he's saying, I was arrested, but I wasn't charged with anything. Therefore, the arrest was the nothing. And the prosecution is trying to use the arrest to show that he had a predisposition to sell drugs. And he's saying it wasn't a predisposition to anything. They didn't charge me with anything. And so, uh, it probably, the answer probably should not be stricken. Besides, even if the prosecution got the judge to strike the answer, the the the, uh, the defense counsel on, on the redirect would just ask him, you know, please explain more about the arrest, and he would. So one way or another, he's going to get to explain the arrest. Uh, so you ask here about the objection at line 29. Isn't it true you were arrested by the police for selling marijuana? Is that relevant? Well, it is uh, not relevant to impeach because it's the wrong kind of thing to impeach with. Uh, it was, uh, even if it, if it is relevant to impeach, it's not admissible to impeach because we have these rules about what you can do to impeach. So raise the impeachment issue. Secondly, 
uh, is substantially more prejudicial than probative. Raise that issue and say it shouldn't. Have, and so, therefore, the uh, uh, the uh, um, question is: Isn't it true you were arrested for selling? Raise those issues here. Foundation. Um, the uh, um, foundation means that the 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 DA who asked this question needs a good faith belief that the person really was arrested for that. And then finally the exclusions. Uh, I think it's, it's not hearsay or anything. It's just, it, but it is more prejudicial than probative. We already picked that up. So there aren't any other exclusions. And they want to strike Dan's answer. Uh, should the court strike Dan's answer? The answer is uh, no, because for one thing, even if the court struck the answer, Dan's attorney would just come back and answer, ask the same question, so the evidence would be admitted anyway. Item 5. The defense called Cal, Dan's employer, as a character witness. Now, it is very common on these evidence questions that they put some issues regarding impeachment in there. And here again, we have a whole call of the question devoted to impeachment issues. Here, this impeachment, because they're going to try to impeach her by poor reputation for truthfulness. Our opinion. Let's go ahead. Item 5. The defense called Cal, Dan's employer, as a character witness. Okay? Um... Dan's entitled to character witnesses. We're going to say Dan's a good person, such a good person he wouldn't sell heroin. You can put your good character at issue, and you can you know, offer your good character, peacefulness, wouldn't sell heroin, honesty, if you're charged with embezzlement. So here's his character witness, and what does the witness say? So the defense laid a foundation showing that Cal had known Dan for 10 years. That's good. Over the prosecutor's objection, Dan's lawyer asked if he had an opinion on Dan's good moral character. Well, in the federal courts, character can be established by opinion or by reputation. But in the common law courts, character can be established only by reputation, not by opinion. So it depends on which courts are in here. Uh, does Dan have an opinion on, on uh, pardon me, does Cal have an opinion on Dan's good moral character? Well, the uh, good moral character seems like a character trait that is contrary to selling heroin. And so if you are, uh, if the, uh, it seems contrary to the trait of selling heroin, Uh, and therefore, arguably, Dan should be able to put on his good moral character. Now, the problem you can mention here is that good moral character is pretty broad, and the character trait should be addressed to the the offense. And here, this person is charged with the intent to sell heroin. So, what character trait would you offer this person? Uh, uh, is a non-drug seller? Well, you, I mean, good moral character seems to me about as close to that as you're going to come. So I think that this is a proper character trait to be offered. Here comes the answer. Cal answered, Yes, I and everyone else who has known Dan for many years know that he always tells the truth. Oops. That's not the character trait that we're looking for. And so is, I mean, it is one aspect of good moral character telling the truth. But it's not the one that addresses this offense. 
so it's not admissible as character evidence. It also is bolstering Dan as a truthful witness. When, uh, and so, uh, if Dan has, if the prosecution has attempted to impeach Dan as a truthful witness, then you can offer Dan truthfulness. But you can't offer Dan's truthfulness in evidence unless Dan's truthfulness has been attacked. Well, was Dan's credibility attacked? Well, I think so. I think when the prosecution uh, asked Dan, uh, weren't you arrested for, uh, by the police for selling marijuana in 1994, I think that might very well be to impeach. It may be offered to show propensity to sell drugs, but it also might be offered to impeach him. And it's a bad mechanism for impeaching, but if it were offered that purpose, then Dan's credibility has been attacked. And if it has, then uh, Cal's statement that Dan is a truthful person would be admissible. Otherwise, if you don't think uh, Dan's truthfulness has been attacked, then it is this statement about Dan's truthfulness is not admissible. And that's the end of that question. Um, our next question we can maybe make a quick work of. Um, let's Let's go to um, the question uh, from the February 02 bar. This was not an assigned question, but it's a good one. Let's do it quickly. February 02 bar, Phil's hair loss. Phil sued Dirk, a barber, seeking damages for personal injuries resulting from a hair treatment Dirk performed on Phil. The complaint alleged that most of Phil's hair fell out as a result of a treatment. At a jury trial, the following occurred. A. Phil's attorney, now Phil is the injured party with most of his hair out. Phil's attorney called Witt to testify that the type of hair loss suffered by Phil was abnormal. Now, Witt needs to be an expert to give this opinion. But let's continue. Before Witt could testify, the judge stated that he had been a trained barber prior to going to law school. And he took judicial notice that this type of hair loss was not normal and instructed the jury accordingly. Oh my goodness. So we have the judge testifying. We have a judicial notice issue. Uh, and we have expert testimony. Three issues here. Uh, this is this is someone is rendering an expert opinion. So all this business about when can expert opinion be admitted. So there's expert opinion issues here. Secondly, we have the the judge and the judge does is the judge an expert? Judge went to barber school. Is that make him enough of an expert? I don't know. Maybe. But uh, since the judge is rendering an opinion, it has to be an expert. Secondly, the judge is testifying. Is that permissible? Answer is no. And thirdly, the court takes, takes judicial notice that this is abnormal hair loss. 
And under 2-201, this is not something you could take judicial notice of. It's not something that is you know, well known in the geographical area or subject to verification by undisputable sources like an almanac, calendar, or something. So those are the three issues you need to write about there. I won't try to do all the analysis, but as to uh, item A, they ask you, was it appropriate to take judicial notice and instruct in the jury on hair loss? And so the answer is, judge shouldn't have testified at all. Secondly, um, hair loss, is whether or not it was abnormal, is a question for an expert. We haven't met the expert requirements. I don't think we have. And finally, taking judicial notice at a, a criminal trial. If the court does, does take judicial notice at a criminal trial, the jury is instructed that they are not required to conclusively agree with the judicially noticed fact. Item B. Phil testified that right after he discovered his hair loss, he called Dirk and told Dirk what had happened. And, Dirk, and Phil testified that Dirk then said, number one, I knew I put too many chemicals in the solution I used on you, so won't you take thousand dollars in settlement. Well, several problems here. One is that um, we have an admission. So at first we, uh, the, uh, we have hearsay that the person is saying, uh, the Dirk is saying, I mixed it wrong. You often that for its truth, use the admissions exception to the hearsay rule. So you have admission. You have an offer of settlement that needs to be discussed. Offers to settle are not admissible to show fault. Um, and there's a question of whether or not this really was an offer to settle. So as to part one, we have admission and we have the offer to settle the required discussion. Item two, uh, I fixed the solution and now have it corrected. Well, is the fact that he fixed the solution relevant to anything? Not really. It's a subsequent remedial measure also, but it doesn't tend to prove anything here. Foundation, yes, exclusions and else. I don't think it's admissible because I don't think it's relevant. Uh, and you also have uh, subsequent remedial measures, but it doesn't seem to matter here. Three, don't worry. My insurance company told me they'll take care of everything. Well, you know the rule against uh, 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 disclosing insurance coverage to the jury. Uh, it can't come in. It can come in to show other things, but not to show fault. So here, my insurance company will cover everything is not relevant. Foundation is excluded under 411. 411 says, you know, you can't use your insurance company to show fault. You can use the fact that the uh, uh, that's covered by insurance uh, to show ownership or something of that sort, but we don't have any of that. So take a look at 411 about uh, insurance. And you might also claim that it is uh, substantially more prejudicial than COVID because if uh, the jury knows the insurance company is going to take care of the whole thing, that may uh, influence their verdict uh, too much. So you can use 411 and 403. 411 and 403. Item uh, C. Phil produced a letter at trial addressed to him bearing the signature Dirk. Okay. Uh, the letter states that Dirk used an improper chemical solution containing too many chemicals on Phil's hair for his treatment. Okay, so that letter certainly is relevant. 
Phil testified that he received this letter through the mail about a week after the incident at the barbershop. And the court admitted the letter. So should they have admitted the letter? Well, is the letter relevant? Yes. It's, you know, it's admission. Proper foundation. Well, for a document, a letter, you need to authenticate it as what you say it is. And, and, and there is a signature that it's jerk. We don't know that it's his, but the jury can decide that. And uh, Phil says, I got it in the mail from Dirk. So the jury, so that it's a uh, proper foundation is here. The jury may not believe the signature, but right now we have enough to get it to the jury. So the contents of the letter are relevant. Proper foundation, foundation is the best evidence rule, and the uh, 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 and authentication. Exclusions. Um, it's outside of court. It's an admission. It's not a court statement offered for its truth. It's an admission, so it comes in under that exception to the hearsay rule. Finally, comes the last the item D. Uh, in his defense, Dirk calls chemists who testified as an expert witness. So I, I presume that they qualified him as an expert. They don't, go, they don't go through the qualifications here, but they're saying he testified as an expert, so I assume they vordeered him and asked him, you know, why do you say you're an expert? And he says, you know, I've got all this background. So, uh, chemist testified as an expert witness. Well, that means that chemists will be permitted to render opinion that he's an expert. And he says that he applied uh, to his own hair the same solution that had been on Phil's, and he suffered no hair loss. Well, when that is not an expert testifying on the basis of his extensive experience and knowledge, background, so forth. This is, if anybody can do this, just try the same compound in your hair. So, this is not expert testimony. This is simply saying there is at least one person in the world that this uh, compound didn't destroy their hair. Uh, I don't know that that's relevant, the fact that there is a person in the world that it didn't harm. I don't think it's relevant and should not be, should not come in. Furthermore, it's, uh, I guess it's an, is this, is this expert rendering an opinion? This is, he didn't say he's rendered an opinion. He simply says he didn't suffer any hair loss. So it's not expert opinion. But experts can do more than just give opinions. Experts can uh, uh, educate the jury. Uh, and so what an, edu what an expert might do in a DNA trial, for example, is to educate the jury on the issue of DNA, how it works, how you go about identifying people with DNA. Well, a lot of us saw that at the O.J. Simpson trial. So experts can educate juries or they can render opinions. In this case, this uh, ex-person apparently was qualified as an expert, but he's not rendering an opinion about whether or not this product is defective or not. He's not rendering an opinion, and he's not uh, educating the jury. He's not giving them the benefit of some, you know, vast amount of... Uh, a knowledge or experience. All he's doing is an anecdotal event. So this testimony is not admissible because it's not expert opinion. He's not educating the jury. It's not, it's not relevant. The fact that this same product did not harm somebody else one day is not even relevant. shouldn't be in. Okay. That is the end of uh, this analysis of a number of evidence questions. If you have questions about any of those questions, please let me know. That's the end of this lecture.